We'll start on page 1272 in my Bible. <clears throat> Yeah, that's the, that'd be the New Testament. <clears throat> yeah, it does. Amen. The name of the class is Redemption Truths. <laughs> However, it is class number one, so at this point it's just Redemption Truth. <laughs> but by class number two, we will... <laughs> we'll, we'll be rolling, that's right. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. Hey Amen. Well, uh, as we start our class, it's good to have uh, Mary here with us. And uh, <clears throat> um, also Sharon with us. So, so we got the moms. And um, Tony and Heather are also with us. And that's... That's a blessing, amen. And Doug, Doug, I'm sorry I missed your call again. Uh, you got important stuff to, to say, <laughs> and I need to get back with you and find out what it's all about. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, I've been moving a little slow the last couple of days. <clears throat> John asked me, how you doing? I said, well, I'm about in second gear. <laughs> All right, before we actually get in the workbook, which is not a good sign. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to just sort of address a couple of things from the, be the beginning. <clears throat> a lot of times um, when I'm sharing, I try to say things at times that are a little shocking that will make people think. And uh, so uh, I have one of those today, and that is we're talking about redemption, uh, and, and this, this course is primarily referring to the plan of redemption <clears throat> um, and not the larger eternal plan of God, which is included in the eternal plan of God because you can't reach that eternal plan that God had in mind until you're born again and you're uh, no longer an enemy of God. <laughs> and so you can see how that would be important, you know. <clears throat> um, but um, a lot of times when we talk about um, salvation and redemption and those kind of things, uh, a couple of things come to my mind. And one is um, that it, my experience, and again, my experience may not be your experience, so don't compare experiences, but try to hear what I'm saying in it. My experience <clears throat> was that when I first got saved, I don't even remember who mentioned getting the Schofield Bible, but it's the one that I still have, and it's got notes galore and stuff like that. And and I got it right after I got saved. And, <clears throat> of course, I wanted to know what all this was about. So it's got little subheadings on righteousness and, you know, a ton of subjects. You know, adoption and all of these subjects. And it's, and it's got the information right there. You can read about that. And it's not as bad as a Dake's Bible or a Thompson Chain reference. But it's, it's, to, the, it's to the point. <laughs> and it gives you a lot of good information. And so... I did exactly what any hungry young man would do <clears throat> in his early 20s. I dug in and, you know, I read, you know, I'd be reading the Bible and then it'd have a little note down at the bottom and I'd read that. And then there were times that I would just look in the back and they would say, okay, here's the, the note on, you know, again, righteousness or whatever. <clears throat> and, and what I did was I, I tended to focus on trying to learn the Bible truth of it, <clears throat> not knowing that there's sort of a theological Bible truth and there's sort of a knowing things by the Lord or by the Spirit. <clears throat> 
And uh, they, they don't have to be separate, but I think many times they are. And that's because <clears throat> uh, you can learn Bible truths without even being born again. I mean, you know, you can read somebody's, you know, you can read, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can buy your Dake's Bible and know everything. You know. <clears throat> um, uh, and I didn't, I didn't really do that at first. I really dug in to know the Bible facts of it. And, and that, again, that's fine, and, and it worked out. <laughs> however, however, there's some people it doesn't work out so well for, and here's why. <clears throat> uh, and, and we, you know, this, this applies to people who teach the eternal plan of God, deeper life, or nominal Christianity. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can um, begin to approach God on a basis of, you know, learning a bunch of facts and thinking that's going to be the answer. <clears throat> and as you learn those facts, you feel pretty good about yourself. You think you're doing good. But one of the things that happens for some of us is that when we don't really get, get that truth in us and we don't get it in us from the Lord is that when we face circumstances and situations where that reality needs to come up, it doesn't come up because it's just, it's filed away in a <laughs> big, long file cabinet of information. And we don't even know how to apply it or where it applies or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, for example, um, the, you know, the situation of, of um, you know, the, there's therefore now no condemnation in Christ. <clears throat> great truth, great reality. But if you haven't seen that, you've only heard it or read it, uh, you actually can experience condemnation pretty bad at certain times and not know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You mean you're under condemnation, but the fact that you're under condemnation? Yeah. Well, you're, that's right. I mean, because you've, you've studied it, but you're under condemnation, so you're under condemnation because apparently you, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know better than me. <laughs> like I said, I, I got out of it pretty good. <laughs> but not all of us do. I mean, really, honestly. Can, I mean, you can, you can uh, um, I, uh, you know, I'll just tell you flat out. I know, I know people that have been in the Lord for 25 years at least. And that they regularly, uh, when I say regularly, I'll say once, let me just be kind here and gentle, once a year, come to me freaking out whether they're saved or not. Yeah. Well, you, most, many of you know who I'm talking about, but I won't name names. Mallory Patrick, not really. It's not. It's not Mallory, and I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, I. You know, I, I really do apologize, but I just. You know, Mallory, I do apologize, I, but I just feel that Mike Wallace needs a break. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Boy, do I know that story. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's information. I mean, if you, if you said to the person I'm talking about, well, you know, are you saved? Well, it depends on what time you're asking them. And it sort of depends on what mood they're in or how well they did that week or, you know, the, how much activity the enemy's trying to beat them or do something, you know? <clears throat> and um, uh, salvation and redemption isn't based on a whole bunch of truths that you put together and go, well, this is it. It's based on spiritual reality, and when we're going to cover a lot of that, and much of it you know. Maybe you'll learn a few new things in this, 
but the more important thing is, is what, what in this does the Lord want to say to you? Not, not even what, what is it that I'm saying or what I want to say, um, but what is the Lord? Because if there are unfinished parts to us as the building of God, you know what I mean? There's still areas that, that the walls are broke down, the enemy can come in and stuff like that. He's not going to, the Lord's not going to just be trying to fix the good parts. He's going to be wanting to help you out over here, you know. And uh, so you have to listen. And, you, ha and you, have to, you have to learn not to listen to terminology, but to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the terminology can turn you off. I mean, for some person, it, they might really like that. But another person, the way you say it may really affect them. And, but, but God may be still trying to use that. Do you understand? God, you know. And he's trying to get us into a, a place where we're not motivated by what people are doing or what they're not doing. We're not motivated by the speaker if he's totally is the kind of personality that appeals to me or, or uses the kind of wording that just, you know, uh, there's some people that are, you know, really word people, word using words, and there are other people that are real visual and they paint a picture, you know, and, you know, somebody who's really good with words, you, you know, and I happen to be a visual type person, and I do paint a lot of pictures when I'm talking, and, and they're going, you know, okay, Van Gogh, what's, you know, what are you trying to say here? You know, they don't get it. They don't, they just doesn't communicate. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit can still communicate to you. The main thing is, don't turn off. And I'm not, and, and I'm not saying all of this stuff in relationship to me or this class as much as, this is, this is the stuff we need. This is the way we need to be. <laughs> this is, you know, we need to be more open. And I don't, I don't mean open to anybody or anything anybody, t I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about open to the Holy Spirit to be able to show you right in the midst of something that you might be wrestling with. But you say, Lord, I want to hear from you. And he goes, okay. And he just starts rolling with the truth. And when you get through, you'll say, well, Brandy didn't say a word of that, Lord. And he goes, that's fine. You know, he told you to listen to me. You know what I mean? And when it's all said and done, I would rather you listen to the Holy Spirit than me. I've listened to me, and it's not that good. But the Lord is. And he'll, he'll bring you on and wants to. And again... <clears throat> he'll work on those areas where the walls are down or where the, you know, there's problems or, or <clears throat> danger or just need where you're, you're not even danger, just a need where you're at. But he's not going to come up to you and give it to you on a silver platter. You know, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open. There's a spirit of hunger. There's a spirit of desire for the Lord and, and, and a willingness to, <clears throat> you know, I know when I first, I first got saved, there were, there were some, and, and in Bible school, there were some people in Bible school that, um, oh my God, the way that they taught was against, it was just totally against the way I was as a human being. Even. <laughs> I mean, really, it was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, you know, taking a rusty ax and trying to, you know, work on, you know, you're just going, ah, you're hacking me to death, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Lord had to deal with me about that and say, you know what, I can use, I can use anybody. I can use a donkey or, a, you know, whatever word you use for it, but you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, someone that you're not, you don't feel any sort of affinity to. And I know, and I know many of you have done that, but not everybody here is fully in tune with that spirit. And, and I just think that uh, it's a good way to start. You know, it's a good way to start. <clears throat> All right, so let me hack you with a uh, rusty axe. Rusty axe. Um, <clears throat> in reality, there's no such thing as a personal savior. Now, I'll qualify this as we go. In reality, 
from a certain angle, there's really no such thing as uh, a personal salvation. Okay. Now you just, you know, just listen, listen, don't fight it, you know, <laughs> and don't, and, and do like Mary did when she got the news that Christ is on the inside of her and is going to come out of her. That's, that's us. We're the body of Christ, we're, and, and we're going to bring forth the Lord. <clears throat> she pondered those things in her heart. She didn't say, I accept anything anybody says. No, please. <laughs> no. Don't accept anything, or particularly don't ex just accept everything that I share. Please. Ponder. That's what the word says. She pondered those things in her heart. Ponder those things. And hold them and let the Lord show you something. Because a lot of times the way that modern day Christianity, the way that we've been formed, we have had things shared with us that we, we're just, you know, we're just happily going along. And it's, we're almost, you know, Paul talks about this dull of hearing at times. The, you know, dull of hearing. We can't really hear what's being said. And so sometimes I use drastic phraseology and things to sort of wake us up so that we can hear what the, you know, what the Lord's saying. And a lot of times it may not be exactly what we thought was being said. Not exactly what we thought, but it still may be the Lord. And in this case, I ask you if you'd turn to Ephesians chapter one, or maybe I just told you page 1272. And Ephesians chapter 1 <clears throat> is uh, primarily given to this truth of being in Christ. This truth of being in Christ. Now when you hear that, there is a tendency, forget nominal Christianity, there is a tendency within deeper life groups to latch on to that phrase and uh, almost attribute holiness or magic to it because the speakers do. Or maybe you even see it a lot in the scriptures and so. But there's no magic or there's no uh, holiness to a phrase. There's only the wonder of the spirit given interpretation of human words. And one of the things that has helped me to understand that little phrase, in Christ, or in, it's used over 200 times in the New Testament, in whom, in Christ, in him, you know, uh, all the different phraseologies, in Jesus, <clears throat> um, is to read it in union with Christ. In union with Christ. And the, the common picture that we have used is, of course, a circle. And that circle represents Christ. And then, you know, we're, we see ourselves in, in him. And, and that's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's good, but it's limited. That, again, that's like human words. Well, that little, a little circle and littler circle on the inside of it is just chalk on a board. What God's explanation of these things, so much greater. When Jesus began to explain this reality to us, for example, he uses it throughout, really, like the Gospel of John quite a bit. But by the time he gets to chapter 15, he uses it in a different picture than this. He uses it as a vine and a branch so that you can see that the branch is not on the inside of the vine. So you don't take the branch and shove it on the inside of the branch and go, okay, now I'm in Christ. But rather it's in union. And from that union, and that, that union really is the connection or the grafting point or the abiding point where the reality of what's happening is 
is that you are abiding in the union. In other words, you're, and here we, here we part from theology and we go into spirit-wrought reality on the inside of us, where in your walk, you don't let things separate you from Jesus. Now, now, Maybe theologically we would say, well, I'm still in there. Or maybe we would even say, well, I'm still connected to the vine or whatever. But you say, well, how are you feeling today? I, I just feel separated from God. Okay, well, feeling that way is fine. Because that's just a feeling. <laughs> you know, you're not separated from God. And you need to talk to your feelings. Amen. <clears throat> you know, that old song says, have a little talk with Jesus. No, you need to have a little talk with your feelings. Jesus is doing fine. <laughs> you know, and, you're, and, and those feelings come and go. You know, they do. They come and go. <clears throat> but the reality of being in union with Christ is eternal I love the way Hebrews spells this out throughout the whole book. You know, as long as we hold fast our, what is the word, proclamation, declarate, profession, profession of faith. <clears throat> and almost, I, I haven't really looked, I haven't counted, but almost every example I can think of in Hebrews is directly dealing with holding to that union in Christ. Okay, and okay, so um, from that vine branch relationship, we begin to realize that there's something actually very real that happens when you're staying in union with Christ. And Jesus described it, abide in me and I in you and my life will be in you and you shall bear much fruit. Okay, obviously a branch has no ability to bear or, or, to, or to produce fruit. It can only bear fruit. What's the difference? Well, the difference is modern day Christianity and the Bible. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, modern day Christianity tries to encourage you to get out there and produce fruit and to and to do that. But as a branch, it's just like a, a straw or a tube. You know. It has the life of the sap, the living, the, the life that's in the vine is the same life that's in the branch. And that's how fruit comes about. It's not from the branch, but from what's in the branch. Christ in you. Okay. And so he says, abide in me and I in you and you shall. He didn't say you better or you ought. He said, you shall. It's, it's a given. It's an automatic. All right. So, um, as you know, in that picture of the vine and the branch, you, 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 you're drawing things. Uh, you're drawing on things that you can't draw on in this picture right here, this circle with the little circle on the inside uh, of you being in Christ. There, although that has validity in, in certain realms of, of this truth. Um, but always the, the truth is that you're in union with what you're in. Okay. And the example I've used before is that if you have a garage and you pull your car in it, the car is in the garage, but it is not in it the way that we're in Christ. It's, they're two different things. They're not the same. They're not of the same. And, uh, so, you know, we, so, so this little picture of a circle and then a circle within that of being in Christ can, in our minds, if we don't, if we don't, if we do not see this from the Holy Spirit, it won't mean anything. And we could, in our minds, imagine a reality of just being a car inside a garage. Well, I'm in Christ, you know. However... Watch out, because I'm liable to drive me out of Christ and down the street. You know what I mean? You see how we, our minds work? And our minds are, are tough, man. The carnal mind, whew, it's tough. Because it'll, it'll, 
you know, it'll just figure some way out of not being in union with Christ. And the enemy will also hit you and try to convince you, <clears throat> okay, and, and so when you're at your best or in the middle of a service and it's just the, the power of God is there and everything and you go, I'm in Christ and man, you could, you, you just, oh man, it's just so powerful in you that you're in Christ. What happens two weeks later when everything's falling apart and you don't feel like you're in union with Christ and you look at other people and they seem to be uh, full of life and you don't seem to have that? There's only one way that you can be full of life and that's to abide in union. One way and that's the only way. And there can't be another way. So, so something has to, you know, you're not going to be able to get a chair and a whip and go at your carnal mind like a, 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 an untamed tiger, like you're some sort of lion tamer or something. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shape you up, carnal mind. <clears throat> no, you can't shape up the carnal mind, you know. You have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what it says in Ephesians. Renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that renewing is a transformation. It is a, it is a part, part of that relates to having the mind of Christ. But that's still different than a renewed mind. The mind of Christ is related to a selfless giving. His nature. Okay, you can check that out in Philippians 2. But the renewed mind is a mind that, what does it say in Colossians, renewed in the knowledge after the image of him who created him. It is, your, your mind is renewed to the person that you're in union with, Christ. Okay. All right, so Jesus knows you're at one with him. He never, he never backs down on that. He never doubts it. You can feel like, you know, God hates me. You know, God, don't, you know, I know right now God hates me. No, you're one with him, you know. But your mind must make the transition. And it's not going to do it by just studying theological facts. Okay. We're coming back around full circle, and that is that in the process of these things, even if they, you know, I, I would say the, the biggest danger that we would have is saying, oh, I know that. You know what I mean? Somebody's going over a lesson, you go, oh, I know that. Okay. Oh, I know that. Okay. Come on. Give me something I don't know. You know? I mean, I remember, uh, I remember when I was teaching, Doug will probably remember this. First time he invited me to Costa Rica to do a conference. And uh, I got up there to share, and I shared my first session, sat down. I was going to share a bunch of sessions that day, and sat down, and sat down by uh, another guy It was real close to Doug at the time. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Uh, his initials for his first and middle name were JW, but it wasn't Brother Lumen. Um, and he turns to me and he goes, oh, man, I thought you were going to bring some really good stuff, man. He says, we already know about being in Christ. And I held my tongue, you know. It was just a short break. And I sat there and I, and I got up there the next session and I started with, maybe you're not hearing me, but we're not talking about being in Christ we're talking about the Christ in whom we are. Because it does you no good to know you're in Christ if you don't know the Christ who's in you and, and whom you are in. And that makes it about him, not about a theological thing that affects me. You, you see the difference? <clears throat> Man, big difference. Well, if you don't see the difference, somebody can say that to you and you go, you know, you, you'll go, well, 
this God taught me this. I mean, you know, I came all the way to Costa Rica and you already know it. Let me tell you, nobody knows the Jesus in whom we are to the max. We all can grow in him. There's always room for all of us, thank God. And that's wonderful. That's, that's not bad news. That's good news. <clears throat> all right. So um, <clears throat> these scriptures here, uh, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. <clears throat> All right. Um, the wording here is important. Look at it. Make sure you see what it's saying. It says in whom we have redemption, not by whom. Is, now, is that significant? Well, yeah, it's the difference between Jesus doing a work and Jesus being the answer. It's the difference between Jesus giving us an answer by the work that he did or him being the answer. And we know, we know inwardly that Jesus is the answer. We all, every Christian knows that, even if they can't tell you why they know that. They know he is the answer, not just that he's the answer giver, and, and it's this little word in instead of by that you begin to discover Christ as more than one who worked on your behalf, but one who brought you into himself and thereby brought you into all of these things. That union brought you into that, including including the very simplest of truths, salvation and the forgiveness of sins. Now, you know what's gone before this. I mean, he's talking about in Christ. I mean, in, in him before the foundation of the world and, and uh, uh, in the beloved, except that in the beloved, these things have gone before these very scriptures. But here, he is identifying that even the work that we, you know, as, as nominal Christians may say, okay, there's salvation. You know, we, we put this circle, we don't put ourselves in it, and we start drawing little presents, little boxes of, of salvation and forgiveness and all these things. And, he, and we're outside of him down here, and, and Jesus is sort of handing us. Jesus is, is handing us those little gifts is the way we look at it like salvation. And, and in many cases, we don't see salvation or redemption. We don't see it in relationship to being in Christ. We see it as something that he did for me. Okay. Now, to have done that, he did it in himself. Now this is, you know, if I ever teach Hebrews again, this will be important to remember or to say, Holy Spirit, I'll never remember that. Please work on me. I'd like to get the full brunt of what he's going to share in Hebrews again someday. <clears throat> um, but it is, it, is a, uh, it is this reality that you... Uh, no longer separate these things from him because if they're eternal truths, they're eternal, they're eternal in the eternal. In other words, you know, as I've said before, eternal is without beginning and without end. It's not just having a start and then without end. That which is eternal goes both ways and the only way anything can be that is when it has come through him as him. It has been added to him in an, um, an essence sort of manner because it, it is drawn from his essence, <clears throat> his being. Um, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, According to the riches of his grace. Now, I shared a little bit of this down in Houston. Um, 
because uh, a little further down it talks about the, the riches of his glory. <clears throat> and over in the third chapter also it talks about the riches of his glory. But there's a difference between the riches of his grace and the riches of his glory. The riches of his glory is, uh, well, let's, let's just go back to that scripture in uh, Romans, what is it, 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory. All right. Sin needs grace. But we've also come short of the glory. And that relates more to the eternal plan of God. Notice how the riches of his grace are specifically applied to redemption, forgiveness, because that's, that's grace. <laughs> that's that's um, uh, that is something that you needed and could not earn yourself. The glory is pure essence. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, outshining of the reality of the Lord that swallows up everything. It swamps everything. It, 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 it pervades everything so that there's no thought of you apart from him. Whereas here, you're not apart from him, but you may identify what he has done by making you one with him in this case. Okay, now that's, you know. <clears throat> All right, so we say, uh, well, let me just draw a little bit different picture here. And maybe I'll try to take this mic so you can hear this on the recording also. I'm free. <clears throat> okay, there's, there is, of course, the cross. And Jesus, it's, it's a matter of how we view this thing. We can say Jesus went to the cross as an individual. So on this side of the cross, uh, I'll put Jesus... And you can know this is Jesus because he has a little halo over his head there. Because, <clears throat> you know. Sure. All right. So he goes to the cross. He, as an individual, he goes to the cross and he dies We'll put it on this side over here. He dies for me. All right. There's a song that says, when he was on the cross, his mind was on me. He was thinking of me. You know, well, there's a lot, a lot of me's that have come and gone since that 2,000 years. You know what I mean? The globe is like... <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> All right. So, so you know, and and don't don't freak out yet, because he did die for you. But he didn't just die for you. He died for all. And that word is more commonly used uh, in relationship. To his death, especially, oh, you really get that, a good dose of that in, in uh, Romans 5, beginning at verse 12 and going all the way to, there, to the end of the chapter, where if one died for all, then all are dead. That's over in 2 Corinthians. But, but this continual realization that in Adam all die, that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Uh, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. The key word in that phrase is in. That what happened to Adam in his fall, boom, happened to everybody, even before we were born. But what happened to Christ in his, oh, you want to say resurrection, don't you? 
what happened to Christ in his death and resurrection happened to us also. Okay. Therefore, the scripture says, for I am crucified with Christ. Uh, it says, know ye not that the old man, and so Christ didn't just go as this single individual that we see him going there for me. Jesus, here we go with the circle, Jesus, before he went to the cross, he joined with a, he who knew no sin was made to be sin, and that word sin is sin nature, it is not referring to sins, to take us to the cross so that we would be crucified with Christ, in union with Christ. Con Cristo estoy juntamente crucificado, with Christ we are jointly, as it says in the Spanish, jointly crucified. It does, the, the effect of that isn't so good in the English, but it's clear in the Spanish. And, you know, I think in the Latin also. So this, this reality was that he didn't go to the cross as an individual. He took us there. And he took us there first to be crucified with him. All right. Um, and then the, the, what is it, 2 Corinthians 5, um, 14. <clears throat> you, you got it there? For the love of Christ. I check every time, by the way. I'm always right. I'm not always right, but... <clears throat> um, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead. All right. There's that terminology that trips us up in, 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 in um, nominal circles. If one died for all, the common phrase would be, then, you know, if, if one died for all, then... We're all saved. <laughs> if one died for all, we don't have to die. But the question is, what is the scripture saying? It doesn't matter what I say or what someone else over there says. It matters what the Bible says. And the Bible says, if one died for all, guess what? The one that went to the cross was us in the one then all are dead. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a work that happened in, in union with him so that our redemption, so that, so that all redemption truths, no matter, no matter if we take the time to discuss them as a little subject in themselves, they're spawned out of this reality of in Christ. And we can never forget that. We should never forget that because that's the surety of it all. That's the security of it all. Okay. That, the, that the truth, the individual subject that we're examining is not the maker or the creator or the initiator. It is one of the results of union with Christ. And we'll be able to talk about these things. And we'll be able to discuss them. And we'll be able to get into them. But, it's, but we're starting this course with the reality that as long as you're in Christ, this is yours. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is already yours. It's already wrapped up. It's already secure. And it's secure not by your works or how good you're doing or... You know, and one of the things we'll get into as we go get into this, and it was a big deal for me in my, probably my first year of my walk with the Lord. Uh, it was probably a big deal because uh, my real father, and then he left when I was real young, and then my stepfather, you could be sitting there, of course, they, they were both alcoholics, you could be sitting there laughing. I mean, I had three brothers and two sisters, and I remember one time me and my brothers and were, were sort of sitting around his 
his uh, lazy boy, and he's sitting in the chair drinking a beer, and he'd been he'd been drinking for a while. So, and we were all laughing and something, and all of a sudden, he just I guess he took the laughing. Now we've been doing it for a while, but he took the laughing as if we were laughing at him. He took that beer can and shoved it up into my face and hit my brother with it and knocked us around, stuff like that. We, we had no clue that was coming. And one of the things that we tried to learn to do in that household constantly, it's like we got antennas, was to read moods. And it wasn't always successful because it could turn like that. Okay, one of the things I learned the first year of my walk with the Lord was God's not moody. <laughs> and it was, it was, yeah, it really was good. Because it's like, oh no, well what if he's not in a good mood today? Or what if, you know, uh, you know there's always this, this fear and this... Um, insecurity and all of this stuff that's flying in your face all the time. And so you're thinking God's this way and you realize that he bases this whole thing on the cross and the cross is finished and it's and in his heart it's done and he, he doesn't get in good moods or bad moods or even if he did, he would always go with the results of Christ crucified. Always. And I found out on top of that that if I do the same thing, it's like we're in covenant or something. <laughs> you know, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, because we make that covenant thing a big spiritual thing, but it's just two people agreeing on something. <laughs> it's not all that difficult. And the easy part of it is, is that if that's what you believe, I mean, you're believing better than I am. I mean, thank God you're not believing what I'm believing, you know that I'm not worthy and I ought to be kicked out and I, sh you know, all the stuff that goes through your mind and all this stuff. Shut up, carnal mind. Shut up. Get with the Lord, you know, and, and let your spirit begin to guide you instead of your soul and your feelings and all of the things that assail us. Okay, well, isn't that really what faith is? Faith isn't, you know, uh, so, someone, for an example, somebody in the service or whatever, they, were, uh, they do a heroic type act. And people say, wow, you got a lot of courage. And says, you know, and they're saying it like you went through this without any problem. But the person would say, you know, I have just as much fear as anybody else. But courage is doing it in the face of fear. You know what I mean? It's doing it anyway, you know. And isn't that really what the Lord said to Joshua? Be strong and of good courage. In the face of fear, there's only one way to do that. Number one, get out of the facts and get into the reality. Even the simplest of these redemption truths must have the foundation of the re revelation of Christ. And if they do, they work and they work every time and they work without fail and they work in the face of the most horrid onslaughts that you could ever face. And you see the victory of the Lord over and over because this is the victory that overcometh the world. This, even our faith in this, this is the victory that it defeated the devil, that defeated, you know, every, every enemy. Death, all of them. They defeated all of those enemies, but it's still got to be our victory today. See, we have to make it our victory. You know. All right, well, we'll take a break, and we'll, we'll try to actually start now in the book. That's the, that's the introduction. <laughs>